In this video, we'll learn the bisection method of root finding. The bisection method is one of the most famous root finding algorithms. This is a good algorithm to learn because it's straightforward and easy to implement in MATLAB or any other language. The basic operating principle is derived from the intermediate value theorem. The intermediate value theorem states that if f of x is continuous from an interval a to b, and f of a and f of b have opposite signs, the function must pass through zero at some point between a and b. This operating principle is actually shared among all root finding methods, but the way in which each method arrives at the root differs. Bisection works by continuously checking whether the root lies in a given interval. If you provide the algorithm with an initial bracket which contains the root, the algorithm will sequentially narrow down the length of the bracket until it closes in on the root. Because you must supply an initial interval or bracket, bisection is also referred to as a bracketing method. Another root finding algorithm you'll learn, called newton raphson is called an open method because it doesn't require an initial bracket. Bisection assumes f of x is real and continuous in the initial interval. This assumption holds for pretty much every problem in this class. Before we progress, I want to hammer in the point that whenever we talk about a function in root finding, we are implicitly talking about a function in f of x equals zero form. What this means is that the function we're trying to find the root of has zero on one side of the equal sign. For instance, if we wanted to solve x cubed equals 27, what we are really doing is finding the root of the function x cubed minus 27. In this case, f of x equals x cubed minus 27, not x cubed. See the root finding introduction video for more details. The bisection method is known as an incremental search because you must specify an increment, or an interval, over which to search for the root. The interval must contain two points which have different signs when evaluated by the function. This backwards looking E symbol means such that, so this statement reads, the bracket xl and xu must be chosen such that the sign of f of xl differs from the sign of f of xu. This is a crucial step that many people overlook. Next, you assume the root is located somewhere within the interval. The interval is then halved or bisected, and the algorithm looks for the subinterval which contains the sign change. Within this subinterval, you reassign xl and xu accordingly, and you iterate until you converge on the root according to the stopping criterion of your choice. Let's take a look at bisection visually. Let's say we want to find the root of this unknown function f of x. From the plot, we can see that the root occurs just after x equals 50. For our initial guess, let's choose a conservative bracket, xl equals 0 and xu equals 100. We see that f of xl is positive and f of xu is negative, so we've correctly chosen an initial bracket since there's a sign change. An initial bracket of say, xl equals 0 and xu equals 10 would be invalid because f of xl and f of xu are both positive. This means the interval either contains no roots or an even number of roots, but the algorithm isn't advanced enough to tell the difference. We then have the initial bracket and assume that the root lies at the midpoint of the boundaries. So we get two subintervals, one from 0 to 50 and one from 50 to 100. We keep the subinterval which contains a sign change and discard the other. In this case, the interval 50 to 100 contains a sign change, so our new bounds become xl equals 50 and xu equals 100. For the second iteration, we split the interval 50 to 100 in half and assume that the root lies at the midpoint. We now end up with two subintervals, 50 to 75 and 75 to 100. The interval 50 to 75 contains the sign change, so we will work with this interval in the third iteration. Once again, we bisect the interval, evaluate the signs, and select a new subinterval for the fourth iteration. This process is repeated until we hone in on the root. Every iteration, we split the last interval in half and proceed with the interval which contains the sign change. How do we know when to stop the algorithm? We use a stopping criterion. A stopping criterion is essentially a tolerance. There are two main stopping criteria we'll use. The first is a tolerance in x. After every iteration, we compute the percent relative error between the estimated root at the current iteration and the estimated root from the last iteration. 
If the percent change in x is less than some pre-specified tolerance, we stop the algorithm. Intuitively, a small percent change in x means we're probably very close to the root. The other condition we can use is a tolerance in the function value. After every iteration, we evaluate the absolute value of f of x r. If it's less than or equal to some tolerance, we can stop the search. Intuitively, this means that the function evaluated at the root must be close enough to zero. Which stopping criterion to use will be specified in the problem statement, but you should know that there are two possibilities. In general, I prefer a tolerance in x because the formula removes any issues of scale that may arise, but it's really personal preference. An interesting property of bisection is the ability to calculate the maximum number of iterations needed to converge. Suppose you give the algorithm an initial interval xl to xu. We know that the bisection method continuously cuts the length of the interval in half. After the first iteration, the interval is halved. This means that the absolute error between the true value of the root and the estimated value of the root produced by the first iteration is also cut in half. After the second iteration, the interval length and the associated error are halved again, and so forth. This pattern can be expressed by this equation, which says that the true error in the nth iteration equals the length of the original interval divided by 2 to the n. If you solve this equation for n, you get the following equation, which defines the max number of iterations needed to reach a certain true error allowance. For example, let's say you picked xl equals 2 and xu equals 10. We'll assume that these are valid initial guesses. We also know that a true error of less than 0.0001 is acceptable. If you plug the numbers into MATLAB or any other calculator, we get n max equals 16.2 iterations. We can't have 0.2 iterations, so we have to round up to the nearest integer and we have n max equals 17 iterations. This formula actually represents an upper bound on n because the algorithm may converge to a sufficiently accurate answer before you reach the max number of iterations. Knowing how long the process will take in advance is handy, especially if you're trying to decide whether to use bisection or another method. Because the error in the current iteration is half the error in the previous iteration, the bisection method is said to exhibit linear convergence. In other words, it converges, but relatively slowly compared to other methods which have things like quadratic convergence. One of the greatest benefits of bisection is that it will always converge to the root if the initial guesses are valid. This is because of the incremental nature of the algorithm. However, this can mean that the algorithm is slow if you provide an incredibly wide initial interval. Another pro of bisection is its logicality. No matter what the function is, you know how the algorithm will perform. This can be a double-edged sword when it comes to large or complicated functions. While you may know how the algorithm will operate, you will also know that it will be computationally expensive. Finally, you can compute the max number of iterations it'll take to reach a certain error before you actually run the algorithm. To summarize, the bisection method requires two initial guesses which bracket the root. These initial guesses must be made such that the sine of f of xl and the sine of f of xu are opposite. If so, then the bisection method is guaranteed to converge linearly. Finally, you can calculate an upper bound on the number of iterations it takes to attain a certain true error a priori. See you next time.